Welcome to ESD School, brought to you by Attract. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel so you don't miss a single episode. Enjoy the video. Hello everyone, I am Jean Grimaldi. And this is Louis Jean Agnot. We are two endoscopy fellow in Lyon. We are going to tell you the story of the treatment of superficial lesions of the digestive tract from the first endoscopic resection to the advent of ESD. It's a long story made up of a multitude of small advances leading to a revolution in the care of our patients. ESD, I will practice it today. It is a story of advances in understanding oncogenesis of superficial le lesions, as well as procedural and technological progress. Finally, it's a story that has been written in parallel on several continents, with a great deal of competition, certainly, but also with a high level of scientific collaboration that has allowed the scientific knowledge and practical, practical ex expertise we have today to emerge. Today, we'll start with the early days of resection, taking place mainly in the USA and Japan. And then our focus will shift towards our own ESD adventure. Before discussing ESD itself, we must first return to the origins of endoscopic resection. The need for it emerged in the 60s, when several teams around the world discovered the adenoma adenocarcinoma sequence. At that time, polyps were treated exclusively by surgery with high morbidity rates. This discovery created a need for minimally invasive treatment of colorectal polyps, leading to the advent of endoscopic resection. This story begins in 1969, when the young and ambitious surgical resident, Hiromi Shinya, met the promising young engineer, Hiroshi Ishikawa, at the Beth Sinai Hospital in New York. These two Japanese, immigrants to the US, would go on to revolutionize endoscopy by developing a polypectomy technique using an unmade snare connected to a high-frequency current generator. At the same time, they developed the first colonoscope, which looked somewhat like the ones we, knew, we know today. Shinya was the first to achieve a secular intubation rate of over 90% in the mid-70s. Ten, year, ten years later, a new technique emerged in Japan with the aim of increasing the R0 resection rate. Called strip of biopsy, it was a precursor to EMR. It involved injecting saline into the submucosa and then, using a double-channel endoscope, pulling the lesion with forceps to increase the margins trapped in the loop. Four years later, Still driven by their obsession with achieving a complete resection, Dr. Hirao's Japanese team came up with a major breakthrough, making a circumferential incision using a needle knife to ensure healthy margins around the lesion before resecting it with a snare. Unfortunately, this rather amazing technique required considerable, considerable skill to perform given the risks of, per of perforation from using the needle knife. In the early 90s, EMR became widely available, but R0 resection of lesions larger than 2 cm remained rare, unpredictable, and prone to numerous complications. A team at the National Cancer Center Hospital, NCCH, in Tokyo, was the most advanced in optimizing existing techniques given the major public health issue that stomach cancer represents in Japan. It was then that collaboration between Dr. Ono and Dr. Ozokawa of the NCCH in Tokyo led to the development of a revolutionary knife equipped with an insulating ceramic ball, the IT knife. This innovation enabled mucosal inc incisions to be made without damaging the muscle. Very quickly, experts at the NCCH, led mainly by Yutaka Saito and Takui Gotoda, attempted to dissect the submucosa using this IT knife, which gave ESD its name. The first cases were reported by Japanese experts, who recounted epic adventures that often ended late at night and were completed the following day. ESD was now born 
and its development would be spectacular. While ESD was born thanks to a safer knife design and the genius of few Japanese masters, the path to democratization would involve several major advances in the early 2000s. The first was the development of the cap, which was necessary to ensure, to ensure sufficient stability for difficult procedures. In 2003, Professor Yamamoto's team published the first case of colonic ESD using a conical cap that was still very rudimentary but remains indispensable more than 20 years later. In 2006, a technological gap was reached with the introduction of ESD knives equipped with a water jet. Two companies are at the forefront of innovation in this field and will soon be marketing two of these revolutionary knives. The flush knife, developed through collaboration between Professor Toyonaga and Fujifilm, and the dual knife, developed by Olympus and Professor Yagi, which features a more turbulent lateral injection to prevent obstruction of the cadaver. At the same time, in Lyon, France, Professor Ponchon had the idea of working with researchers studying hepatic hydrodissection to develop a high-pressure injection knife. This marked the beginning of the Nestis adventure, which will become the subject of research for young Vincent Le Pillier and Mathieu Pioche, who did his PhD on the topic. Although the idea of hydrodissection of submucosal fibers was quickly abandoned, this technique paved the way for high pressure injection knives that optimized submucosal injection. The patent was bought by a Boston scientific for the development of the Pro knife, which did not, however, use the very high pressure of the initial idea. In 2007, all of these technical advances culminated in the first publication by Yagi and Fujishiro of a large-scale prospective series of ESD of colorectal lesions with impressive results. More than 90% of unblocked resection and only 5% of perforations. These results mark the beginning of the widespread adoption of colorectal ESD in Japan. At that time in France, these results had not yet reached the ears of our diet goals, for whom the treatment of large colorectal lesions remained mainly surgical. European debuts were mixed at best. It was the Germans that initiated the ESD experimentation in Europe with their 2004 pilot study that disclosed less than 25 unblock resection rate. In France, we took a bit more time, and it was in 2011 that we disclosed our first pilot study with 188 cases with around 77 unblock resection rate, which is more acceptable, but with a very concerning safety profile of around 18% perforation. When you see these results, you can't help but ask, what are the reasons of such a difference between East and West regarding ESD adoption? First, historically, there was a significant technical skill set gap between Japanese and Western endoscopic practitioners for ESD practice, but also for endoscopy skills in general. Second, there is a known difference in the prevalence of cases with far fewer gastric cases and gastric lesions in Europe than in Japan. Those lesions, while harder on the diagnostic side, are in general easier to resect and can be a very good way to gain experience and confidence in your training journey before tackling more complex lesions. Lastly, time is given less of a focus in Japan than in the West, where it can influence decision making in a choice of technique between ESD and EMR, of course, largely historically in favor of EMR. But, as you can see later in this presentation, every one of these problems has, has its solution. So first, how to tackle the technical skill set gap? Of course, we must move to Japan to learn how the masters do it. So here, in this illustration, it's young professor Gabriel Rami that went to uh, learn from uh, Toyonaga Sensei. Afterwards, it was a young professor Mathieu Pioche that went to um, Japan also to, to be a fellow of uh, Saito Sensei 
he went there for a year and uh, earned his permission to um, to perform ESD on uh, humans and it was uh, was the first foreigner to earn so how to deal with the different prevalence of chronic versus gastric lesions and the difference they have in difficulty well of course let's use the international innovation at our advantage how not to start without talking about the great uh, underwater technique that has gained a, a great bit of fame it was described by Kenneth Bean Muller um, in 2012 and um, was later uh, applied to ESD. Of course, it's uh, very easy, it's very useful, especially in the first phases of the um, procedure during the circumferential incision and the trimming phase. It even helps to gain some speed, but uh, according to the latest study, only when uh, gravity is unfavorable. Then, of course, we can mention the procedural innovation, mainly the pocket creation method out of Japan, and the different technical innovations. Of course, the transparent hood that is really mandatory for every dissection, and the different types of knives, to name a few, um, the dual knife, the knife from Ecotech, the hybrid flex knife with this very high pressure, etc. Then, we must innovate ourselves to help us and uh, our colleagues uh, all around the world. Innovation has really played a central role in improving some mucosal dissection techniques since the French ESD school was founded. Advances made possible by the French school include the invention of the tunnel by Dr. Le Pillier in 2013 that has now become the gold standard for esophagus uh, resection. Of course, research on high pressure injection of macromolecules that led to the development of the high pressure anesthesia knife, and more recently, the hyperfix pedal fixator from Mathieu Pioche. But the technical improvement that has led to the most progress here in France is undoubtedly traction. You are all familiar with the principle, which involves creating an endoscopic left hand in order to expose the tissue. Well, the sinker clip was initially developed in Japan by Professor Yukata Saito. It was the first time that the traction ISD has been disclosed in uh, the public space. However, it was not immediately adopted either by Japanese nor international teams and the practice um, fall into abandon. Without prior knowledge of this ID, in 2017, so a while later, Arnaud Tailleur, a nurse on the Limoges team, proposed the idea of elastic traction using orthodontic elastic to help expose the tissue. And he proposed this idea to Jérémy Jacques and Romain Legros. They indeed rediscovered an idea that was uh, forgotten. This marked the beginning of French really love affair with traction and the techniques widespread use in France. Initia initially reluctant to deviate from their Japanese mentors, the Lyon team was eventually convinced. And in 2021, they added lateral loops to create a multipolar traction system that applies traction to all four poles, not just the entire pole. And it was crafted uh, by uh, our nurse called Solimbra. Once more, we retrospectively found out that the idea of multipolar traction had already been disclosed by a Japanese team led by Satoshi Miyamoto. Then, in 2022, my colleague and friend Join and I joined the story when uh, I, a young intern, had the idea to add a pulley mechanism to transform multipolar traction into adaptive multipolar traction. This marked the beginning of the attract adventure and journey. After three years of hard work, we progressed from this prototype, which was handcrafted by Sulimbra, to an industrialized version ready for commercialization in late 2025 to early 2026. Then, we need to find a regional or national team to work with to team up and join forces in data to create a large cohort and answer bigger questions. In France, we have done this by creating the FECO cohort 
that collects prospective data from centers in France and Belgium, totaling more than 5,000 legions and counting, which is quite enormous for really a small country like France. With this data of really great quality, the FECO team has been able to deal with important questions, such as a reset column study comparing ESD and PISMIL EMR in a randomized manner, not to spoil anything, but you know what I think about this comparison, or more lately, the need for closure in lesions of the right colon to prevent the risk of bleeding, or even analyzing niche indications like our study where we gathered 100 lesions of the leocecal valve. Then, once you and a core endoscopy team are proficient in the technique, you need to help others to become proficient too, because you obviously can't cure every patient and you need a reliable mapping of your country to treat all. So you must organize a full ESD curriculum to train fellows like me and senior endoscopists without prior ESD knowledge and skills. And please, if you're not motivated, keep in mind that if you don't train the young endoscopists that want to do and perform ESD, they will try to train by themselves. They will achieve, of course, poor outcomes and you'll have to deal with the consequences of their mistakes in the end. So for that, you will need the help of your National Endoscopic Society. Actually, it's in the recommendations of the ESGE to have a national training program. And it's in this context that the SFED, here in France, organized the training with Jeremy Jacques and Mathieu Pioche as, as um, leaders of it. Each year, there are 35 applicants and 16 are accepted into the program. The selection, the selection is based on motivation, previous CSD experience, volume of the centers where the plan to um, be enrolled at, afterwards of more than 50 cases a year and mentorship as well as territorial coverage. As you can see here, we've achieved really a great coverage of the territory and the results post formation are indeed very encouraging. Well, as I told you before, I told you that every problem will have its solution. Well, now we have more than 60 advanced ESD endoscopists, around 5,000 cases a year, a great scientific output, and we think we dealt with the um, difference in time between EMR and ESD that will tip the scales in favor of ESD because we reached a speed of 60 mm square per minute in a latent prospective study. So it really feels like we've hit the ESD lottery. In conclusion, this final slide summarizes the history of submucosal dissection in France and the steps to copy to obtain the same results in your country. We believe the following are the pillars for achieving this goal. Effective training, both yourself and nationwide through a training program, is mandatory. It must tackle diagnostic characterization, theoretical knowledge, and the dissection technique itself. Even if it's very difficult to start with this, why not rely on foreign or local experts? And maybe, for the theoretical part, the SD YouTube channel. Then, starting from the larger scale and working our path down to the smallest, you must obtain the support from your national endoscopy societies. Then, you need to engage in effective scientific cooperation to create a stimulating, work, a stimulating working group, you must share tasks and innovate to progress and maintain motivation through time. Then, you must visit international experts because, as you have seen, combining several techniques is important. You need really an ESD portfolio to respond to all clinical situations. And with that, you might just obtain a nationwide ESD. Thank you so much for your attention and see you next time. Thank you for watching. If you found this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe, and share it with your colleagues. Until next time, this is ESD School by Attract.